In this video, I'm going to be talking about the projection operator that I sort of hinted at in the last video. And so in the last video, we saw this here, where if we act this part here in square brackets on this vector here, then we get the the alpha i symmetry species vectors times this uh, g over g alpha, where g is the order of the group and g alpha is the dimension of our representation. And so if we just sort of multiply both sides by g alpha over g, we end up getting this operator right here, where what we see is we act it on this vector here, and it projects out just the parts of the vector that are in the alpha representation right there. And so we can actually say that this part here is an operator, and in fact it's a projection operator, and we will use the Greek letter rho here. And notice I have rho and then the subscript i, i here because we are using just the diagonal parts of the matrix representation there. And when we are using just the diagonal parts, we have uh, this property of item potency. Uh, and so if we want to look at that using our C3V representation, and so this is that direct product of the, the C3V representations that I was using in the previous video. And so we can uh, act our row 1, 1 twice on the E1 basis vector. Uh, so that starts with, so we are again doing the same thing as in the last video where these basis vectors are being changed based on all three of the uh, of the symmetry operations. So the the identity is the first one, so that's why it stays at E1. Then we have the C3, the C3 inverse, then we have the, the three reflections here. And so when we act that on it, we end up getting this part here in red. And so then when we do the second operation on the part that we had in red up here, so we are now acting this row 1, 1, on this here. And so if we go through all the math, and I'm not going to sort of sit here naming off numbers and stuff, but uh, I do have this math all explicitly laid out. And if you want to look at that closer on your own, then I would definitely recommend checking out the the lecture notes, which are linked to in the description down below. But once we go through all that math, we once again end up with this right here, which is exactly the same as what we had right here. And so it seems that performing this operation on our E1 twice, so if it's this 1, 1, so it's on, if it's on the diagonal of our matrix, then we just get the same thing. And so that's that item potency that I was talking about, where uh, if we square this, and obviously you could do that as many times as you wanted, uh, not just twice. Uh, we just get the, the, it's just the same thing as doing it once on our vector. And so we say that uh, this squared is just the same as the row I, I there. So more generally though, we can define this. And so now we don't have just the, uh, the diagonal elements of our matrix representations here. So we have the I, J here. And so if we uh, perform this one and then this one, so different, uh, different of these operators on our vector here in a row or successively, then we end up with this. And so we have a row I, L here, uh, and then these two Kronecker deltas right here. And so we can test this again with our C3V example. So we're going to use the row IJ, row KL. And so we set our uh, alpha equals beta. And then we have K equals L equals J, which uh, and that is not equal to I. And so we can have the first one be the row 1, 1, because we're saying that the, uh, the K and L here are both equal to each other. And so once again, we get this right here, which is, you know, the same as what we had up here. But uh, now we are going to perform the row 2, 1 instead of, the row one one again. So we perform the row two one on this right here. And so once again, you go through all the math. And so 
now we get this, which is uh, different than the one that we had up here. But if you remember from the previous video, this is one of our basis vectors, and so that will actually uh, that will actually be important here in a little bit. And so this is doing the same. Uh, as, this is just doing the same as the row two one. And so remember, we did the row one one, then the row two one. But what we did, what ended up happening, is just the same thing as doing just the row two one, which makes sense. Uh, since we have, uh, if we do the row i, j, row k, l on e1 here, that we end up with uh, uh, with these Kronecker deltas and the row i, l, where the row i, l is our 2, 1 here. And so uh, that's uh, our Kronecker delta where we have alpha equal alpha because they're both alpha. Uh, and then we have the delta 1, 1 here and then the row 2, 1. Uh, but now if we do it so that we have j not equal to k, so for this one up here, uh, we were doing it where j is not equal to i. And so we were saying this second one here was not equal to this first one here. Uh, and so that actually did give end up giving us uh, something, uh, one of our basis vectors here. But if we do it where j is not equal to k, so we have, uh, say, this j here not equal to this k here, which is, uh, as we see, part of our Kronecker deltas here, then we should get 0. So we know we should get 0 from that. And so we do the rho kl, so which is the rho 2, 1 here on e1. That gives us this. Then we do the rho 2, 1 uh, on that. Uh, so yeah, up here we did the uh, row 1, 1 uh, on it first. Uh, and so we see after we go through all the math here that we do in fact get 0. And so that makes sense because that's what the Kronecker Delta has told us that we should get. Uh, we could do the same thing for alpha, not equal to beta, but uh, I'm not going to show that here explicitly. Uh, I hope by now, just looking at the fact that I've gone through all the math here, that you would trust me that that would be the case. Uh, so now we can show that uh, if we have, if we do the diagonals here, so we sum through the diagonals and then sum through all of our different representations, that that just gives us the identity element, and so it would just give us uh, the vector that we are acting on back again. And so with this. Uh, means more explicitly is so we you know sum through the ones on our one dimensional uh, on the one dimensional representation here so that was just a one by one matrix so it'll just have a single value but then we have the uh, two two diagonal and the one one diagonal elements and we sum those together and so on our C3 group uh, we would get back our original E1 starting vector. We know from the last video that uh, we got these things here. So for the row 1, 1, the row 2, 2 on it was equal to 0, and the row 1, 1 uh, for the one dimensional here was equal to this. Uh, so summing through these, we do see that we end up getting our E1 back. So we're acting, uh, we're acting sort of each of these uh, on our E1 and then adding it together. So this one was zero, so we're just adding this right here and this right here. And so we add those together and we do in fact get our E1 back. And so therefore we have the following three properties of our projection operators here. So we have this item potency for the diagonal elements. We have this orthogonality here. Uh, so we need the J and K to be equal and the I and L to be equal and the alpha and beta to be equal. And we have this completeness here where when we sort of sum through on all these diagonal elements, it just gives us the identity element here. And a consequence of the orthogonality is that if we do the rho i i and rho j j, that that will be equal to zero unless alpha is equal to beta and j is equal to i. And so if i and j are equal to each other, that just uh, gives us our uh, item potency. And so uh, this means that the projection operators are mutually exclusive, meaning the projection of one species
So the beta J species leaves no component of another species uh, alpha I. And so, you know, that makes sense because if we, you know, we talked about our, our projections. So if we have something like this, uh, let's see if I can draw that a little bit better. So if we have something like this and we have some vector sticking off here, then the projection is this. So that should leave no projection. So if we want to then project this way, uh, you know, onto, you know, maybe some surface back here, if we project it down here, there's going to be no projection of this vector uh, onto here. And so it makes sense that if we sort of project down onto here and then try to project into this third dimension that we just sort of eliminated, that we would get nothing from it, that it would be equal to zero. So sets of operators with the above properties, so these ones here in red, are called spectral sets. And so uh, maybe you've heard of sort of spectral theory, uh, like operators in Hilbert space and things like that. Uh, maybe in the future I will make a playlist on that stuff, but uh, for now I'm just sort of uh, showing that projection operators that have these properties are called spectral sets. Uh, so the orthogonality property tells us uh, that if we have this Vj here, so the alpha j species uh, that is equal to the rho jj on our vector here, and that uh, the rho uh, ij on the V alpha J species here, if that's not equal to zero, then we actually obtain this. And so this is essentially an eigenvector uh, equation here. So meaning that this L rho IJ acting on our alpha J species is a vector species alpha I and is an eigenvector of the operator rho II. So we saw above that when we did the row 2, 1, row 1, 1 on our E1 that we got this right here. So the first row 1, 1 was the projection operator. And then the second, the row 2, 1, sent us from one basis vector in our projection into another basis vector in our projection. And so if you remember from the previous video, I showed... Uh, so I had our triangle there, and I, I said that one of the uh, basis vectors that we got uh, sort of came out of this. Then the other two were sort of, uh, you know, like this. And so what we're doing is with this uh, row 2, 1 is we're essentially taking, uh, we're essentially going from this basis vector down to that base, basis vector. And so we can sort of tr uh, shift back and forth between those. And so... Uh, that first row 1-1, one, one, as I said, was the projection operator, which sends us down into this projection here. Then the second sent us from one basis vector in our projection, uh, namely this one right here, to another basis vector in our projection, uh, namely that one right there. And this tells us in general that rho ij acting on this alpha j species here gives us the alpha i species, uh, such that if we sort of run through all these different i's, we sort of end up with the v1 alpha uh, uh, basis vector in the the alpha i species there. So shifting from one basis of a representation to another, uh, it's, a, it's therefore called a shift operator. So using this, we can obtain the full set of basis vectors, uh, which may be generated by applying the vector rho ij for all of the uh, i from 1 to g alpha. And so this means that if we have this uh, rho ij uh, acting on j here, uh, and then we are acting the rho ii on it. So remember, this is like our eigenvector equation here. Uh, then this right here, because the rho ij acting on the vj alpha there is the same as just the vi alpha there, then we have this acting on this being equal to this. And so that's our eigenvector equation there. And so in particular, if we had our row 1, 2 acting on 2, 
that would give us uh, the uh, V1, because remember, we're going from the J to the I here. And so the rho I, I acting on that is the same as the rho I, I acting on this V1 alpha. And so we can actually look at it this way. So we have our rho 1, 2 acting on this basis vector, which sends us to this basis vector. Then when we act the rho i, i on that, we just get this basis vector back, which we already knew from the item potency of the rho i, i. And so we can obtain the full basis using the primitive item potence alone. So the matrix diagonals rho i, i by finding the first symmetry adapted basis using uh, so our C3V example group. So we have the rho 1, 1 here acting on E1 gives us this basis vector here. Uh, then we use one of the symmetry operations on this basis vector here, uh, such as, say, the rotation C3. So uh, we just change each of these bases in here based on the uh, based on what the C3 does to it. So remember, uh, I've been using that triangle that looks like this, and we have the 1, 2, 3. And so when we rotate it, uh, we see that the, the 1 uh, goes to 2, the 2 here goes down to 3, and the 3 goes up to 1. And so that's why these are sort of permutated that way. Then we use the second primitive item potent on this, and we end up getting this, which is our other uh, basis vector in the projection or in the, the subspace. Uh, so that gives us these symmetry adapted bases uh, that we saw in the previous video. So after normalizing, we get this. And so these are our symmetry adapted bases that we got using just the row 1, 1 and the row 2, 2 here. Uh, but anyway, these, uh, this video, as I said, is just some of the properties of these uh, projection operators where sort of the three important properties here are this item potency, the orthogonality, uh, and the completeness. Uh, and so I don't know that, uh, that, that they often call this orthogonality. This is something that I just called it. I don't know if that's sort of the, the actual conventional name for that. But, uh, you know, it, it makes sense that it would be the orthogonality because we have these uh, Kronecker deltas here. But anyway, I hope you found this video helpful and I will see you in the next one.